Kant leaves us in a position where we can answer utilitarian ethical dilemmas, but it seems at the expense of pitting pure abstract universal reason against particular attachments. So I wanna just remind you of why that happens. And it's because for Kant, our capacity to reason exists as an end in itself, by which he means there's nothing we could exchange of equivalent value. Why? Because the very act of exchanging things in terms of equivalent value requires that there be something, someone for whom those things are of value. And that value is connected to who and what they are, their life plans, their aspirations. More critically, it's connected to their capacity to live a life according to a moral law that they legislate for themselves. So to have dignity for Kant is essentially to have the capacity for self-rule tied to our rational nature, our capacity to reason. And it's that capacity that we consult when we ask what is morality? What's the right thing to do? And when we do that, we discover these categorical imperatives that Kant discusses. He gives three distinct formulations. We're focusing really on two that I think nicely illustrate the ways in which this capacity for self-rule is tied to reason and then dignity. On the one hand, we should act as if the moral rule we legislate for ourselves could be a universal law for all rational beings. Doing that though requires that we adopt a posture, contemplative posture that amounts to his, one of his distinct formulations of this imperative. He asks that we treat these maxims as if we're legislating them in a kingdom of ends, what he calls a noumenal realm. We're thinking about this golden rule, you know, what would I legislate as a law for everyone in this position if I didn't know the specifics about the consequences, the causes and effects in which they're bound up. I suggested that John Rawls, the great 20th century philosopher, nicely illustrates this in his idea of a veil of ignorance which is not less a veil, the metaphor of the veil can, can mislead, I think. Uh, it's more of a, one of my mentors once described it, a way of modeling uncertainty with ignorance, moral, moral irrelevance with ignorance. Um, that if we're trying to think of, well, what would everyone get on board with? What would be a, a law fitting of all rational beings? Well, it couldn't be something that's specific to particular subgroups because then the people who aren't benefiting obviously aren't gonna be on board. And that intuition, I think, gets at what Kant is up to here. But because rational nature, the, the rational capacity to reason in this way about morality is an end in itself, then we have to treat each other that way as ends in themselves. themselves. That doesn't mean we don't enter into means ends relationships. Sometimes you scratch my back, I scratch yours log rolling in politics, you know, there's trade-offs, there's quid pro quos, but those can never be the totality of how we treat each other. Those have to be framed against a deeper underlying respect for our dignity. But I suggested that that comes with certain puzzles and you explored some of these puzzles in the tutorials. Uh, we explored one on Monday, tied to, to, to Peter Singer. Um, and the question I pose is why Kant is so particular about tying dignity to this rational capacity. And it can lead to, again, some, some heartbreaking and tr disturbing trade-offs. Do we really expect Peter Singer to say, ah, my mother has advanced dementia, so she's not really a person anymore. She doesn't have that capacity to reflect on her ends, to legislate a moral law for herself. So we can just treat her the way we treat, say, inanimate resources. They're just 
resources in our calculus, costs and benefits. Now, I, I suggested that, that the author we encountered who, who framed this puzzle quite ruthlessly against Peter Singer uh, is a clever rhetorician, but never really answers the question of whether Kant is wrong in this. And one of the ways Peter Singer could have responded to his critics was to say, look, yeah, that's, hor that's horrible. Asking someone to treat someone they love and cherish the memory of as if they're just now, okay, they're not a person anymore. It's horrible. Is it wrong? Now, Peter Singer quite <laughs> tellingly does not pursue that strategy. He was very careful not to say, ah, oh, well, I guess you're right, my mom isn't a person, but what are you gonna do? Morality's hard. He offered a different kind of rationale. But I think we can ask, well, the whole point of this is deontological approach, Kant's turn to reason and duty and, and dignity was to solve the problems that utilitarians inherited from David Hume, which is we really did treat people like they were pawns in a calculus of happiness, pleasure, and pain. And Kant gave us a reason to say, you know what? No, your life matters. And I can't just treat you as a cog in the machine, just another element in the calculus of costs and benefits. But if we, having adopted this position, if we then have to solve all these other problems, we might reasonably ask, I think, well, is Kant's philosophical innovation more moral trouble than it's really worth? Does it create more problems than it solves? Um, against that worry, I suggested there were a, a series of ways in which thinkers have responded to Kant. And a, a family of views just rejects Kant and says, okay, that was, that, was, that was interesting. Yep, I see why rights are important, but since you can't justify them without referring to interests and passions and, 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 and the real world, uh, we're just gonna have to try and take them seriously from within some other ethical framework. And again, utilitarianism does a pretty good job of that these days. And John Stuart Mill is one of the first utilitarians to really show us the power of this utilitarian approach to practical ethics. We'll be exploring him in a couple of weeks. Um, we could also kind of play a, a philosophical game between the theory that guides our practical considerations, our practical ethics, and the broader framework of justification and explanation and ideas within which that practical ethical toolkit sits. And Peter Singer, interestingly, does just that along with his, his mentor and teacher, uh, Richard Hare. They argued that if you wanna know what you wanna do, what's the right thing to do, utilitarianism is really the only game in town. But that doesn't mean it's a simple hedonistic, you know, <laughs> sacrifice the one for the needs of the many kind of theory, because behind an attractive utilitarian ethics is a much richer account of the ways in which we design our utilitarian calculus. So for instance, we could have, instead of an act-based utilitarian calculus, we could have a rule-based utilitarianism that tends towards greater happiness and less pain, even though in any individual choice, that might not be how we're thinking. And how do we justify those rules? Well, perhaps we do it in terms very similar to Kant's. As Peter Singer, answering his critics, remarked, perhaps we can be morally partial. We can say, no, I'm, I, I, I'm right to look after my mom. It's okay that I didn't sacrifice my, my increasingly disoriented and confused mother uh, and give all that money to make a, a real difference in real lives overseas, say, or, yeah, or in, uh, in Trenton. He was in Princeton. So yeah, there's plenty of, plenty of New Jersey that needs help. Um, and he argued that, well, that kind of partiality is okay, provided it has an impartial justification. So simply saying, I, uh, I believe in doing this for all white folk. It's like, yeah, no, uh, we can't find an impartial justification that doesn't ultimately appeal to some racial and racialized view of human dignity. And that's a partial view, a partial justification. 
Whereas if I said something like, look, it's okay to care about the people you love, we all kind of get that. We can understand the rationale um, because it's a universal sentiment to care about the people who raised you. Now, that doesn't mean everyone holds it. I mean, I think we talked about this, right? It might be some people say, yeah, mom, see ya. And believe me, there, there's entire bodies of literature devoted to just those kinds of anxieties and frustrations in families. Uh, but Singer's point is less about those particular relationships and more about the way we understand justification. So that's a, that's a way in which we can kind of get around these tensions we found in Kant. But, um, but outside of academia, the charity he started, or at least the, the umbrella program, uh, really does good work. And, and it doesn't really, it's all to watch him because he doesn't get caught up in these philosophical quibbles. It's just like, look, you can do some good. Um, let's not worry about priorities and let's not worry. Just let's just make sure we're kind of orienting ourselves towards that sort of arc of the moral universe bending roughly towards justice and decency. Um, and in that respect, I think he does kind of come to resemble some of the actual, the unrepentant Kantians who, who think, you know, and that's all perfectly consistent with Kant. Uh, Christine, Christine Korsgaard is probably one of the most interesting and brilliant thinkers in this, this philosophical program working today. Um, and she has a nice book that just came out uh, about uh, animal rights and vegetarianism. And yeah, I mean, she's following the argument to its logical conclusion. If, if you want to avoid the bind we saw Peter Singer put in, where it's like, okay, this high bar of rational capacity to reflect on our ends, that's what generates moral distinctiveness of humans, that's what generates our dignity, uh, but where do you put the cutoff, right? Where do you say, no, you're just not thinking properly about morality, or you can't? And Christine Korsgaard says, well, yeah, we gotta get rid of that, that close, tight binding between reason and dignity. You don't need to show that you have this rational capacity to reflect on your ends. You just have to have the capacity to live a meaningful life, to have relationships that matter, to want to get up and think, yeah, it's going all right. Um, you don't need to have this, this austere capacity to, to reflect on the noumenal realm and the categorical imperative. It's enough that it's your life and it matters to you and you have friendships and relationships. But if you think that, there are a bunch of animals that now should be in our ethical purview. And there are a bunch of ways in which we treat animals that are wildly inconsistent. Dogs, 40,000 years we've been together. Some, some scholars refer to dogs as our first example of technology, that we sort of domesticated them. Other people think, no, the dogs basically domesticated us and they got a pretty good deal out of it. Um, but yeah, 40,000 years, we've been bound together, co-evolving, biologically and socially. Um, and dogs have sentience, right? They, they have a sense of themselves and their relationships. Now, you might think, come on, they just want food and, to, you know, and pets. and Yeah, but it matters to them as sentient beings how their lives go. And they know when you're being cruel. They know when you're being indifferent. They know when you're not a good person. Dogs are pretty good with that, right? Um, pick up a lot of, a lot of things. Like after 40,000 years, they should. Um, pigs, also very intelligent, uh, have incredibly rich emotional lives. Cows, we now are studying, scholars of animal behavior have discovered that cows have this extraordinarily sophisticated emotional life with complex emotional ties and relationships. Um, in fact, one of the things that among people who, who are put off by industrial agriculture and, and, and animal husbandry and, and animal raising animals in, in this sort of you know, mechanized, routinized way is for cows in particular, uh, some of the, the cruelest things are when you have to break those ties. Uh, and so there, there are actually like sort of the ways in which these industrial farms are structured, are structured to try and prevent them forming these attachments. Um, and so one animal, we think, ah, oh, dogs. Others, we think, oh, dinner. 
Um, and so to Christine Corsegar's great credit, I think, she takes this seriously as a philosophical puzzle, right? Because once you weaken this Kantian connection, all of a sudden having a meaningful life becomes the source of dignity. And now, well, now we look upon a lot of things that we do second nature and think, hmm. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a view actually I've been working on myself, uh, but I'll note that after Hegel, and in fact, of a, of one of Hegel's great critics, we could also see dignity as tied simply to the capacity to make a choice. It doesn't matter if it, this, this idea of a meaning, it could be actually quite meaningless. In fact, it could be absurd. It could be a choice you're put in by circumstance where you just reflect on it and think, this is Kafka-esque. Why? Because Kafka's an existentialist. He understood that sometimes you're in, that sometimes what seems to be the most human act, that essence of what makes us free is simply the fact that we can make a choice, even if it's a horrible one. Um, Sartre referred to this as a radical choice. Uh, interestingly, Charles Taylor, who I mentioned in, in, on Monday, uh, thinks that Sartre, and, and uh, not so much Kafka, so, Sartre is just wrong on this. There's no such thing as a radical choice, but it's a coherent, response to this problem in Kant. If you go on to study political thoughts, if you go and take courses with me in political theory and sort of law and policy, uh, a lot of what we, we would be reading would be sort of roughly in or adjacent to this space. It's a lot of work going on in legal theory, and sort of questions of ethics and public policy that fall within this Kant versus the utilitarians versus Rawls. Um, but for our purposes, I want to explore today another approach, which interestingly, and I've, I've come to see this only really in the last I don't know, decade, Hegel wouldn't have been on this course if you'd studied with me when I first started teaching. Um, I would have just made fun of him at various points in the course. And I would have given my one Hegel joke. <laughs> what do you get when you cross a Hegelian with a crime lord? Someone who makes you an offer you can't understand. But I've come to think that Hegel is far more important than I or a lot of people have really given credit for. Uh, but he sees himself as fulfilling Kant's unfulfilled project. How? Dissolving attention that Kant still thinks needs to be dealt with. That we either, with Hume, we, we sort of concede the side of nature. And then the way I've been presenting Kant is a kind of vindication of reason, you know, sort of vindication of the, that first Cartesian impulse, cogito ergo sum. But Kant is still accepting that there's a division there. And Hegel thinks that's the problem. In this respect, it emphasizes a romantic impulse. We've encountered a romantic impulse in a more technical, historical sense already. And I only mentioned it in passing, but one thing Rousseau was often accused of is romanticizing natural freedom, romanticizing people outside of civilization, outside of Western French civilization. Um, that's not entirely fair, but it also has textual justification. But there is a deeper sense in which I think Rousseau is a romantic and is unrepentant about it. And there's no need to apologize because that's the point. He's a romantic in a sense that he reaches back to the past to find possibilities for the present. And in the romantic movements that emerge, in the 19th century in Europe, this is a central feature. The turning to, to old ideas of chivalry, the, the fascination with like castles and ruins and you know, Arthurian, Arthurian lore represents a turn to the past, not to simplify and trivialize them, which is how the pejorative sense of romantic tends to unfold, right? It's like, you know, you're just, you're just a hopeless romantic. You don't understand the real world. 
You don't know what's at stake. Um, but that's not exactly what the romantics were doing. What they were challenging were extant power relations and a status quo of sex and gender roles, of economic roles and, and, and titles, not by engaging in, as the French did in Burke's critical estimation, by simply applying an abstract rational principle and sweeping aside tradition, but by looking to those traditions to find possibilities. So in this respect, the roman this romantic impulse is, is friendly to Burke's criticism of the French Revolution, but rejects Burke's affirmation of a particular interpretation of tradition. They all look, you know, the French tradition, of, the English tradition of liberty. Um, and Wollstonecraft, of course, was scathing, but she's scathing from that French rationalist perspective. You need reason to show you which parts of tradition are worth affirming. The romantics disagree. Not because they don't think not reason is up to the task, they simply don't see that dispute, that tension between our rational capacities and those passions and sentiments and our connection to the natural world and to our own histories. So the romantic impulse in, on, on one hand looks back to find possibilities and relatedly in this period we're entering, that romantic impulse is an effort not simply to find new possibilities in, in the past, say, but to reject this philosophical tension that's still with us. And so this period, roughly, and I benchmarked it here, you, know, you could think of this period, you know, but why is Bach isn't there twice? Bach is worth being in there twice, but it's, he's not supposed to be. <laughs> um, one of the, the striking features of this period is the transformation of emotional complexity in the European arts around this period of first dramatic political upheaval, um, but then these responses to that political upheaval that emphasized the difficulties and complexities that I think are reflected in Kant's effort to find this austere, beautiful, pure intuition that gives us the moral law. And so at this point in history, as, as we're, we're, so Hegel is emerging, um, there was a period in, 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 in German poetry, literature, and, and painting called Sturm und Drang, sort of stress and emotional intensity. Um, I would say that it's not simply the, the sort of nature, reason, mind, body dualism that this movement was, was rejecting or fighting against. It really was this, this contrast that we've inherited since Hume in this tradition between reason and passion, really since Hobbes. Um, I mean, the, the, the precursors to this, again, kind of emphasize, you can see these you know, the grandness of nature and its awesome power against the sort of the, the frail and futile human conceits. Um, and also emphasize you know, the, the, the morbid strangeness of dreams. I want to give that a kind of visual, intense visual representation. You know, Vaselli's the, the Nightmare is, of course, one of the classics in that respect. Um, one of the central themes that Charles Taylor draws out of this period is the idea of authenticity, the search for the authentic self. And remember, we saw antecedents of this in Rousseau, but in Rousseau, again, that search for the authentic natural self created the tension between natural freedom and our rational capacities. Here, we mean to find authentic, authentic selves that somehow transcend and dissolve these tensions we've inherited over these centuries leading into these, the late European enlightenment. Uh, but you, you find this again most strikingly in, in music. I, I, I think I, I, if you want to, I, I won't play these now. I, I have no idea whether they'll work, but um, this is simply a contrast. If you want to go listen to it on the slides, um, you know, Kei Nagano's beautiful uh, renditions of some of the earlier um, Mozart piano concertos. 
Uh, and uh, one of the late symphonies in G, the, the 40. Uh, Mozart wrote two symphonies in G minor and um, one early in his career, he was an adult, but early in his productive life. He died very young, so that was a, a short productive life, but, uh, but by, by the, the, the symphony in G, I guess you can just, You'd want to go back and, and follow some of the links in the other slides, especially the Bach links that we didn't get to hear. Um, let's see. Hearing that progression through the minor key, it's uh, it's happy and upbeat. But you know, the, the G minor is the brooding seriousness of the, the piece. Um, if I were a serious scholar of music, I would have a word for what you should be listening to here. But I will describe it as a, a certain lurking gravitas to the progression rich melodic complexity of the entire symphony um, keep that in mind uh, but now listen to earlier mozart it was more there's a, a, a joyous sort of rich melodic texture to much of early mozart in particular What's striking about Mozart is we see this depth of emotion, complexity uh, over his very short life. Um, and I think it's mirrored in the art and music of this, this moment in history. Uh, it's a marvelous, going back to the Bach, we didn't get to play uh, Glenn Gould playing. There's a marvelous recording of Bernstein uh, stopping the, the rituals of the performance to essentially explain his opposition to Glenn Gould's interpretation of the piece they're about to play. But um, but instead of just simply not you know refusing to conduct, he thought you know, Gould is such a serious artist that he he would nonetheless perform it as Gould wished. Um, The, the contrast there, and we won't go through it here, but uh, I mean, I find is particularly in some of the Bach piano works, certainly in the, in, in the, the Goldberg variations, uh, there's a quiet, passionate intensity that is extraordinarily disciplined within two generations. That discipline is what's being questioned in the music of their day. Uh, I was going to play you Beethoven because Beethoven, I think, captures, some say he is the embodiment of this emotional fullness of the artist in his period. Um, but I will just show you this uh, only because it's cute. We're not going to watch the whole thing. Has anyone seen this? Really sweet. Not gonna let me do the full screen on that. Probably would if I just clicked on it. There. But it won't give me audio. Yes. Have you seen this? <laughs> We're not gonna sit through the entire of the joy, but it was kind of cute and came out at a point, I think, where Europe kind of needed a feeling of something unifying. And this was adopted under the official anthem of 
last great symphony composing this almost half. Um, this is the kind of delirious, joyful happiness, but always tinged with an element of profound sort of sorrow. And that's Beethoven. Flash mob. Kind of sweet. Eventually, the whole orchestra is going to come out. We're not going to watch it. But um, I only dwell on this to ruin it for you. Can you guess what this was for? commercial. this. Uh, they were struggling under some complex EU re regulations, but you'll be happy to know they're still thriving. It just crushed me when I found that out. It's hard not to have the tune in your head, right? <laughs> um, Wittgenstein, uh, the great philosophers and controversial philosophers of the 20th century, um, thought that Beethoven was the culmination of genius. Uh, he was also influenced in his youth by a particularly I think, troubling book. I should research these things more carefully before I riff on them, because now, of course, I can't remember the guy's name. Um, he was an author who published some some a strange book that would probably, he, he was a serious scholar, as so many Austrians of this era were. Um, Stendhal, I can't remember. I'm not, but um, he had a book where he described the duty of genius, that you should strive for genius. Uh, men strive for genius. Women, sort of their, their chaotic and confused emotional natures hold back men from their true genius. Uh, but this young, passionate author discovering that he wasn't going to fulfill the genius, of, certainly of Beethoven. Um, he killed himself in the same flat where Beethoven spent the later years of his life growing more and more deaf, and then became this weird cult hero of the early 20, of early 20th century Austria, influenced Wittgenstein, who I think understood that this bizarrely sexist, very anti-Semitic, strangely sort of hierarchical uh, philosophy this guy was promulgating was, was basically kind of rubbish, but it definitely shaped uh, Wittgenstein's life later on. It, it shaped his sense of what he called the duty of genius. Um, and all through his life, he felt that if you couldn't do something as profound as Beethoven's work, then find something more productive to do, go be a doctor or a carpenter. But, um, uh, and, and Wittgenstein, obsessing over, over the peri this period, uh, grew more and more distant from his contemporaries, convinced that the science of the, his day, Einstein, Bertrand Russell, advocating uh, for peace and uh, for science, uh, they didn't understand the real depth of what it means to be authentically human, that word again. Uh, and that's a running critique that traces back to this period, this historical period, uh, where we encounter Hegel's. Now it's gonna start with that. There we are. So Hegel is writing his famous phenomenology of spirit as Beethoven is composing the Emperor's Concerto, as Napoleon's armies are marching into uh, Jena. He's not himself, I, I wouldn't say he's a romantic himself, but he is clearly of a mind with this search for authenticity, 
the search for an authentic, unmediated experience of the world in all of its complexity and all of our emotional richness that is still ultimately a tribute to reason. So Kant, Hegel thinks, simply hasn't pushed far enough. Hegel will argue that reason contains its end within itself. So Kant is right to think of our rational nature as being an end in itself. He's confused to think that that rational nature is limited to us. Thought is the underlying principle. And it has to become conscious of itself, not only in our own minds, our own lives, but in the world, in the universe. <sighs> There are those who, who try to, I think, resurrect a certain reading of Hegel that wants to pretend that, that this is not a grand theological metaphysics, that it's not saying that there is a rational principle underlying reality, and that when we look at the world rationally, it looks back at us rationally. Not because, as Kant thought, we're imposing reason on the world. We're not constructing its rational character because of the categories of pure intuition of space and time and personal identity. No, the world appears rational to us because it actually is rational. Reason is marching through the world, consciousness becoming aware of itself. It's hard not to read this as a theological approach. Um, but to be clear, whereas others, certainly the English Hegelians, I think, had a tendency to assume that that march of reason through the world, that consciousness becoming aware of itself in its universality and in its particular immediacy in our own minds, they looked and thought that has to be God. This has to be a story about traditional Christian, Judeo-Christian theology. But in my mind, and, I, and I, I'm not just making this up, I mean, there are serious Hegel scholars who agree with this, and I'm not a serious Hegel scholar, but they seem to make a, a strong case. Um, and this is why Kierkegaard is going to be so striking. Uh, he thinks that this theory subsumes religion. Religion is just one moment in that attempt to reconcile that abstract universal with the concrete particular of our own experience. And reason is one way we've tried to wrestle through that. But at the end of the day, it's simply one moment in that unfolding. So when we reject these dualisms that Kant simply inherits, Hegel thinks it's not simply that we transcend them, we just recognize they were never there in the first place. What we gain is an unmediated, authentic encounter with the world as it really is, because we've reconciled, we haven't reconciled, we've recognized, we've comprehended, as Hegel would say, that reason simply is reality. I mean, it's a, it's a striking claim, um, but it, you can see how it answers the kinds of concerns we, we had with Kant on Monday. It's like, well, the problem with Kant is he gives us this abstract, this method for coming up with abstract universal moral laws, and they seem to run roughshod over the things that make our lives matter in the first place. Family, friends, lovers, community, neighborhoods. And Kant seems to suggest that, that none of that matters to morality. But why would morality matter if it weren't for those things? What would it matter for? You have to live a life in communities, in relationships, in our own heads. And Kant takes that in our own heads seriously and seems to ignore the rest. And so Hegel is going to take this grand metaphysical thesis and use it to tell a story about how we understand the unfolding of history that shows that the problem with Kant is he was just too obsessed with reason. And that's going to involve a logic, a way, of a way of thinking that's radically unfamiliar. It's radically unfamiliar. It's very different from the way we would say teach you logic in a philosophy course. Um, but it does get at, I think, some of these problems 
associated with Kant. Well, what could motivate us to act out of duty? And Kant seems to think, oh, it's just, you know, pure reason. It's, that's being what well, being free is. But being free for what? And so I think at his best and at his most useful for us as students of politics, of history, I think Hegel shows us we can take seriously both reason and the passions, both history and abstract theorizing. How he takes it seriously, well, I still have reservations. And as we'll see, uh, there are two great moments in history where people who had reservations with his method changed the world. Uh, the whole bat thought. But before we get there, let's explore the specifics of Hegel's argument. I say it's a, it's a logic, a method, very different from how we would teach logic. Logic, as we teach it in philosophy courses today in the Anglo-American world and the English-speaking world, tend to emphasize propositional reasoning. We focus, it has a kind of geometric flair, right? Uh, we're, we're teaching you a certain way of thinking that starts with simple definitional propositions and simple rules of manipulation. And with those simple rules of manipulation, we can combine those basic primitive definitional propositions, those axioms, and come up with theorems, propositions that we can establish the truth value of. Wittgenstein, who I mentioned, one of his great innovations was giving us what we call truth tables. And if you ever do introductory philosophy and go on to do logic, you will see that we still use these. Even though Wittgenstein himself rejected his entire work on that. Um, Hegel, when he says logic, he means something different. He means a kind of unfolding. We look at propositions, or we look at concepts, ideas. We look at history, events, interests, agents. And Hegel's method asks us to find in, say, a proposition, inner tensions that unfold. And then as those tensions manifest themselves, they resolve into a more sophisticated proposition, a more sophisticated understanding, a more accommodating, a more advanced, what have you, social or relational state. This is a way that Hegel never describes it himself, but it's a way we, we often teach it. It's, I would say it's, it's not quite right, but it's not wrong enough that we stop teaching it this way because it, it, it's a useful simplification of what Hegel's up to. But we often teach this as the law, a, a dialectical logic that takes a thesis, confronts it with its antithesis, and resolves into a synthesis. And again, in all of his works, and in all of his works titled The Science of Logic, Hegel's Logic, the Encyclopedia of Philosophical Logic, Hegel never describes it that way. But it's not a bad way to think of what he's up to. He's not asking us to establish self-evident propositions and relate them in ways that generate more complex propositions about which we can confirm their truth or falsehood. No, the dialectical logic is dynamic. And again, it's tied to this metaphysical conception of reason unfolding. That's what reason does. And for Hegel, it doesn't just do it in our heads. It does it at the level of reality. And again, contemporary Hegelians will bristle a bit at that characterization. So, oh, come on, Hegel's not really saying it, but he is. And I, I think, I think Hegelians should own it. Um, why would they own it? Because uh, again, it sounds a bit kind of matrixy, right? There is no spoon, everything's consciousness, it's everything's pure consciousness, it's reason unfolding, becoming aware of itself. Great in science fiction and Judeo Christian eschatology, but you know, philosophy and a philosophy undergirding science, it ain't. Uh, but on that, I just want to pause and tell you a story about a research program 
that I was involved in as an outside critic, uh, a lazy outside critic. Um, but I still look upon it with some fondness. Has anyone ever heard of the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi? The Beatles hang out, hung out in the 60s, but um, it's a natural law theory he describes. <laughs> um, and this is a, it's a theory you'll find in like tabloids, the weekly world news. Sometimes the Maharishi groups will take out center pages for these ads, but they actually have universities. The Fair, Fairfield, no, Fairfax, Iowa has a Maharishi University of Man Management. They're gonna open one in Niagara Falls that was combined with a theme park, but the funding fell through, but they do have, have several other universities. Um, and the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi has a theory, had a theory that all of reality was a unified field of consciousness. And he ties this back with some creative and canny marketing uh, to some ancient Ayurvedic theories of what today we would call metaphysics. It was an ancient South Asian pedigree to this particular philosophical thesis. Um, but he was convinced and cleverly patented and trademarked a lot of the relevant techniques and Ayurvedic health products. Uh, he was convinced that if you studied his particular style of transcendental meditation, that you could bring your particular consciousness into harmony with the unified field. And when you did that, when you got enough people doing it, a critical mass of people who had linked their particular consciousness with the underlying abstract reality of the unified field of consciousness, good things happen. You, know, you sort of became more peaceful but good things happened around you too, because the unified field was more stable around you. There are ways to read it as a metaphor, as a metaphor for say, you know, what, what feminist theorists call like an ethic of care, where we think about relationships as the core of our ethical our framework rather than abstract principles. The abstract principles aren't important, but we frame them in light of relationships. So we could read it as a metaphor for something like that. They don't mean it as a metaphor, they mean it. <laughs> as a theory of reality. And they went out and tested it. They have a series of experiments that are still ongoing where they get a critical mass. They have a theory about the what the critical mass is uh, relevant to the population nearby. Uh, and they get a group of people who are trained in transcendental meditation and they meditate in this hotel room or wherever they are. Uh, and then they do these sort of basically a pretty simple, I shouldn't say simple. It's, there's nothing wrong with their statistical techniques. They do a series of intervention analyses uh, and discover that when you get their, these people meditating, they did it in Jerusalem and a whole series of, you know, there were fewer deaths by armed conflict and fewer auto crashes. The Jerusalem study was a bit difficult because it turns out there were cities in Jordan that were technically closer uh, and crime rates went up. Uh, and so at first they tried to rescue the theory by saying, well, it's emotional distance and cultural distance, not spatial distance. But then they realized that was an ad hoc, uh, unscientific way to approach it. So they simply reformulated the experimental design and they did it in Washington, DC in 1990. And yeah, you look at the time series data afterwards, there's this cascading effect where violent crimes decrease, suicides decrease, uh, auto accidents decrease. And they, uh, they did science discover the harmony of the unified field. You need a critical mass of meditators and they have to be trained in the specific technique and you stick them in the Watergate hotel, it turns out. Um, I was a few years away from living in Baltimore at the time. I swear it would be pretty awesome to have been in the study, but no. Um, but yeah, that's a, look, as I said, they weren't, they weren't idiots about this. Uh, they published it in a, in a serious social science statistics journal uh, and have since, maybe, even, I don't think they ever hit quite as high as they did with social indicators research, but it was a serious journal. They published the, the, the stats, all the treatments, all the, um, yeah, it, 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 it met all the standards that we would apply here, like if we were publishing an intervention analysis in the social sciences. I, I, I mean, I, I, was a, I was a grad student at the time when I first heard about this. It was a few years after the, the, the DC study. I was living in Baltimore at the time. You know, I, I trained with these serious mathematicians and social science stats people and 
you know, we were, we were cocky bastards and we were, our big thing was going back and finding shoddy social science of the past decades and replicating their analyses and showing that they were wrong. And again, sorry for the technical jargon, but we were kind of assholes, this generation of, of people trained in sort of serious social science statistics and, and formal theory. Um, and I heard of this, and of course, not wanting to do my actual research, I emailed uh, William Orm Johnson and uh, said, can I see your data? I want to see this data. And, uh, I was fully expecting them to blow me off, but he emailed me the next day, said, yeah, here's the data set. Here's you know, the, the, the actual code we use for the uh, analysis. Here are our, you know, our treatment description and records. He sent me the whole shebang. And it was done up exactly like we would do like a pre you know a pre-registration of our treatment protocol for an experiment in psych or in you know like my good friend and colleague here jay roy uh you know, he does these pretty cool sort of mixed method experiments and they all pre-register the treatments and all the data and the sort of uh statistical software you have to make public and like this and so that's the norm now. It wasn't the norm when I was studying, but this guy did it. He was serious about this. And he was a super nice guy. And I, I'll be the first to admit, I was not a great graduate student. And I was kind of slacking off. I'd moved to Baltimore. I was drinking probably more than I should have. Um, it wasn't until like two months later when I got this email asking if I'd looked at the data. I didn't even remember. I was like, oh, yeah. Um, and then I would lived in terror for months afterwards because I had to admit, like, I haven't looked at it yet. I, haven't, I, I, I couldn't actually remember where I put it. Basically, I was a pretty crappy social scientist. You know, you ask someone for their data and tools, you take it seriously, and I didn't. But I was terrified there would be this update on their website. It's like, MIT researcher fails to refute our findings. And it's like, I'm not an MIT researcher, I'm a student. Um, but they didn't do that. This wasn't. They, these guys are serious. They seriously think they're, and I got to say, whatever you think of this crazy theory of theirs, they're playing by our rules. They're doing social science and behavioral science. No one's funding them. People are laughing at them. Grants are laughing them out of the place. So they founded their own university with their own ties to, you know, Ayurvedic health products. Fine. But you want to do science and no one's going to fund it. And they're serious scientists. It's a bit odd saying that. They're not serious social scientists. They're not econometricians. They're not behavioral psychologists. A lot of them are string theorists, very serious mathematical physicists. Like you can look up their publications if you want. Um, and this is some sort of sideline thing they see as sort of necessary to establish their credentials of this metaphysical thesis as scientifically testable. You could hold views like Hegel's metaphysics and not be ashamed of them and still think they're entirely consistent with what today we would call modern science. Um, and so I've come to think that the things I used to laugh at reading when I read Hegel, I'm now I sort of feel like, I still don't know how you could test it, um, but when I hear Lee Smolin down at the Perimeter Institute berating some very smart math math mathematicians turned physicists that all this string theory stuff they're doing is basically metaphysics because there's no way to test it. And suddenly this doesn't seem as nutty anymore. It's just not done up with fancy mathematics. So that's Hegel's broader philosophical backdrop. But I think of interest to us is again, this story he's going to tell that's really a kind of philosophical anthropology the evolution of politics tied to something like Rousseau's story of you know, the historicizing of the evolution of consciousness. In this respect, Hegel is very friendly to Rousseau's early method. It's a kind of anthropology. And it's going to basically trace a story of human history, social and political history, as a dialectical unfolding tensions. So, Hegel is, is going to view this as a kind of his philosophical anthropology that rationalizes our history, rationalizes the evolution of consciousness, but 
it's going to have a profound influence on at least one thinker who is going to turn it into a story about the unfolding of forces of material production. And so within a generation or two, uh, Hegel's metaphysics is gonna be largely forgotten. Again, some crazy English philosophers will pick it up. Bertrand Russell will make fun of them, all forgotten. Uh, but Hegel will have a profound influence on European thought. Um, now that narrative, we can tie to the thinkers we've already encountered. And the sections, the selections I've, I've, I've included from the philosophy of right, he, he sees as a law text, right? He's teaching this, he thinks to lawyers. And when I first studied Hegel, it was a law professor who was teaching me. Hegel really saw history and law seamlessly wound up in this, metaphysical thesis about consciousness unfolding in the world. Um, and a part of it, a part of why there is in the book, in parts I didn't give you, specific sections, Prussian code, uh, is because he, he wants to trace this kind of fairly finely grained history of the unfolding of legal precedents uh, against this broader intellectual history that he sees as the unfolding of consciousness. He sees Locke's period as representing this turn to abstract right focused on material possession, focused on the immediacy of, of survival of life, of our material existence. In Kant, he sees that idea of right expressed not as a link to the specific particular embedded bodies that need sustenance, but to our capacity to reason free from those influences. Remember that insight that Rousseau gave us and that Kant took. And then he sees that as unfolding to a richer understanding that these two things are not in conflict, that they can be resolved through a system, a political organization that reconciles our particular needs or particular desires with abstract right. And that reconciliation, we recognize then as not a reconciliation at all, but as a richer whole. Now, the tension dissolves. Now, this is where, again, some of us would probably make fun of Hegel more than he really deserved, but having framed this ambition and this historical narrative, um, it seems like he thinks that the Prussian state is the actuality of this ethical idea. Fukuyama, in adopting this, I'll say Hegelian, but it was really Kojevian interpretation of Hegel uh, as, a, as an unfolding of history um, linked to the idea of freedom. And yeah, Fukuyama famously thought that, you know, the late 80s, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the loss of any systematic alternative to industrial capitalism, market-led capitalism, was the end of history. Uh, he had some, again, Nietzschean ideas tied in there too. Uh, the problem with trying to give this any finality, of course, is that usually history then proceeds apace and shows us we were quite wrong about it its purported end. And you know, I think Hegel's political work suffers some of that fate, but I do think now more than I certainly used to that there's a point to this that isn't sort of triumphalist, that isn't, ah, look at the march of reason in the world. Um, there's a more modest understanding of the task of philosophy. Um, and as, Kojev and Fukuyama are this cunning of reason, right? That look, these embedded contradictions resolve themselves, but it's ultimately the march of freedom or the march of self-awareness or the march of authenticity. I think the problem is giving it that, that end point. Hegel's method really doesn't need that. Interestingly, Marx will keep that feature of it, the, the march of history towards an end point. Um, he'll simply refuse to think it has to do with the cunning of reason. But Hegel, I think, also suggests in his discussion of lordship and bondage, much more modest aim for his philosophical project. In this weird passage, 
he has this story about consciousness unfolding in a kind of Rousseauian fashion, but where Rousseau saw our interdependence creating inequality and unhappiness, Hegel is interested in how that interdependence actually shows the degree to which we need each other. And that's a good thing. For Rousseau, it's the thing that has to be changed. For Hegel, it's a kind of a maturity where we come to understand that, look, now I see that this relationship is more complex than it was. Um, and so I think Hegel may be read in this more modest way. This is a Charles Taylor, for instance, a Patchen Markel. They, they, they use him as a way to show, to put it to grossly oversimplified, the ways that things like culture matter, the way that things like religion matter, the way that being embedded in particular historical circumstances matter. And not in a kind of Humean way to say, and that's it, as far as you can go, but to show how we can still philosophize, we can still ask if there are underlying generalities and principles, um, but that process involves a more rich and complex understanding. So it's, it's not a kind of reason versus you know, the evolutionary psych, you know, the sort of Kantian deontologist versus the Humean evolutionary psychologists. Um, and so that I think is, is, is a useful task. What I want to show is that this task, I'm suggesting that, oh, this is a modest way to use Hegel. In his time, however, one of the striking critics of Hegel, in fact, refused to accept that it was this more modest task that the owl of Minerva spreads her wings only at night, that philosophy always comes too late on the scene to do anything useful other than to reconcile ourselves to history. So while we're not reconciling ourselves to the division between nature and reason, we are reconciling ourselves to the fact that transcend, you know, sort of dissolving that contradiction never matters. It's always historical interpretation looking backwards. Uh, Kierkegaard has a deeper concern. He thinks Hegel is absurdly arrogant in some respects uh, in thinking that reason is still this distinguishing feature, not just of us, but of the universe. 